what was it about this x plus y minus 2z equals 0 equation that made it so magical, um, that made it capable of being satisfied when x, y, and z are all the same, and making it definitely break, definitely not be satisfied when x and y are the same, but z is different. The reason that it works so well is that it really is a kind of averaging equation. It's telling me that there's, if x plus y minus 2z equals 0, if I solve this equation for z, I'm going to get z equals half the sum of x and y. Right? z is the arithmetic mean, the average of x and y in this equation. So this equation number two is kind of telling me about the relationship between three numbers, one of which is the average, the arithmetic mean of the other two. And so, you know, we usually think of an average as being something that's kind of in between the two things that we're taking an average of, right? And so if the two things I'm taking an average of are already equal, then the average will again be equal to each of those two things. Whereas if the two things I'm averaging are not the same, then there's some positive distance in between them, and the average is going to split that difference in half in some way, right? And so then all three of them are going to be different. So we think of averaging as a, as a good way to kind of make the all the same or all different kind of question into algebra in some way. So um, I have an activity here that we'll probably skip over in the interest of time, but of course, what, what it kind of tells us is that there's, there's multiple different ways of defining average-like quantities, right? We don't necessarily have to add and divide by two. We could use other arithmetic operations to kind of convey this idea of in-betweenness. Um, there is also a, a, a path we could walk down that I've done in previous semesters of this course, um, but we don't have time to do today, where instead of insisting that the average be halfway exactly in between the two endpoints. We could just vary that a little bit and say, well, why, why don't we have an average that's 25% of the way from one endpoint to the other? That's still going to satisfy this all the same or all different kind of property. What if we take that percentage and turn it into a variable, a new variable called t, uh, and form a, a convex combination? So like an average, which is t percent of the way from x to y, that's still going to satisfy this. But now I have an extra variable, and I'm going to start to get these you know, like polynomial equations and stuff. That's the path we would walk down if we were driving towards something called the Alexander polynomial invariant uh, for a knot. Um, which, by the way, is one of the invariants I ask you to explore in our knots section, but not from the level of calculating it, um, just from the level of looking up some of its values in the table and using those to discriminate between knots. Um, so here's the, the, the beauty of it, is that the example of averaging that we get from the previous activity is one that we can generalize uh, into this theorem, which says that if I'm trying to color a knot diagram using k different colors, so we're going to call those colors 0, 1, 2, all the way up to k minus 1. Um, then I will have a valid k coloration if and only if at every one of the crossings in my diagram, the color of one arc plus the color of the other arc minus twice the color of the third arc is equal to 0. If this equation is satisfied at every one of the crossings in my diagram, then that must mean that either at every crossing in my diagram, all of those colors are the same, or all of those crosses, uh, all of those colors are different. If any two of them are the same, it forces the third one to be the same. Um, the beauty, though, uh, of this is that this equation, if, if it holds for these, well, I guess let's take a step back here. Let's suppose I'm using only three colors. And if I'm using only three colors, then all of my arcs are going to be called either 0, 1, or 2. Well, that's going to it's going to necessitate a, a kind of a, a challenge for us that we're going to have to answer by using a different kind of arithmetic. So let me pull up my whiteboard here real quickly so that I can point out what I'm trying to say. Switch over to the old whiteboard. Here it is. So let's suppose just for the moment that I have a diagram of trefoil knot. Our favorite non-trivial, see if I remember how to draw it not diagram. That looks pretty good. So here's my trefoil. <clears throat> Excuse me. Your job is to validate the claim that the mod 3 equation, x plus y plus z equals 0, mod 3, is a valid way to mimic the colorability restrictions for a tricolorable, a valid 3 coloration for a knot. And so explain why, if I have three integers x, y, and z, and if their remainders, mod 3, are called x bar, y bar, and z bar, 
but for example, if x was 17, then x bar would be 1, because, no, sorry, 17, x bar would be 2, um, because 17 divided by 3 is 5 with a remainder of 2. All right, so the x bar, y bar, z bar, these are either 0, 1, or 2, depending on the values of x, y, and z. So think with your team about why, if x, y, x bar, y bar, z bar are all equal, then their sum has to be equivalent to 0 mod 3. And then explain why if the x, y, z are all different, that that conclusion still holds, that x, y, x bar, y bar, z bar have to add together to 0 modulo 3. Um, and that if two of them are the same, but the third one is different, um, think about why that is impossible, why that cannot happen. Um, so this now is an equation that not only satisfies, that not only remains true when all three colors are the same, and which we know fails in the case when we need it to fail, when two are the same and one is different, but also, this is an equation which is guaranteed to be true when all three colors are different from one another. And that's something we didn't have before we did this reduction modulo three. So these three checks, these three explanations will justify to you why this equation, x bar plus y bar plus z bar equals zero is a perfect representation of what we need to happen at each one of the crossings on a diagram in order to establish that that diagram has a valid three coloration. All right, so you've successfully verified each of these three assertions that this, what I call magic equation, x plus y plus z equals zero mod three, um, tells me that this equation is satisfied when all of x, y, and z are the same. It's also satisfied when all three of x, y, and z are different modulo three, right? If they have different remainders when we divide them by three. And then also, if two of them are different, or sorry, if two of them are the same, it forces the third one to be the same. Um, because if x plus y plus z equals zero and x is the same as y, this is 2x plus z equals zero. But 2x is the same as negative 1x, and so negative 1x plus z equals zero means x equals z, right? So this equation has the power to do everything that we would need it to do for tricolorability. And so what this gives us is like a recipe for taking a diagram for a knot, like my trefoil that's up here, and turning it into a system of three equations. So at this yeah, at this crossing here, the three arcs that are coming together are all called x, y, and z. And so the equation that needs to be satisfied at this crossing is x plus y plus z equals zero, mod three. Right, so I'm going to imagine that these are all mod three equations. And then at my other crossings, at this crossing over here, the arcs that are coming together are also x, y, and z. And so the equation that needs to be satisfied there is x plus y plus z equals zero. Um, likewise at my third crossing. So the trefoil is kind of, I won't say it's uninteresting, but it gives us a situation where all three of the crossings, all the crossings in my diagram, give rise to the same equation that needs to be satisfied. Like there's really only one criteria for how to color the arcs in this diagram, right? Whatever we assign, whatever colors we assign to x, y, and z, in other words, whatever numbers 0, 1, and 2, mod 3, that we assign to x, y, and z, the only thing they really need to satisfy is x plus y plus z equals 0. But I wanted to write this all out because it shows us that in general, what we can expect to have is a linear system of equations. Um, in three variables, my variables are the colors of my arcs, um, and having three equations, each one of which is coming from the crossings in my diagram. Uh, and if I were to write this out as a matrix equation, the coefficients in my matrix equation would be all ones, and my right-hand sides of my equation are all zeros. And so the problem that I would be left with in linear algebra would be to, uh, you know, discover the reduced row echelon form of this matrix, uh, and that can then tell me what the solution space of this system looks like. I've been teaching a linear algebra course this summer uh, to our undergrads at the same time as, as the one that we've been doing. Uh, and so all of this is very fresh in my mind. The reduced row echelon form of this is actually just a confirmation that it's really only one of these equations that matters because all three of them are saying exactly the same thing. Um, but in the reduced row echelon form, what it tells me, this is blast from the past territory here, it tells me that one of my variables is a determined variable, a bound variable. Uh, and the other two of my variables are free variables. What that means is that two of my variables, in this case y and z, can be chosen arbitrarily, can be chosen however we like. 
uh, it's going to be chosen by us. And as soon as we choose a value for y and a value for x, x is then determined by the values we chose. By y and z. So let's take a step back and figure out what that, what that does for us. Usually the way that this looks in linear algebra is we sort of give y and z some names. Like let's say, uh, let's say y is a and z is b. And a and b are these things that we get to choose. And then x, for my first equation, x plus y plus z equals 0, mod 3. And if I subtract the y and the z from both sides, this is the reason that x can be determined by y and z. We can solve that one equation. Whatever y and z we pick, I just take the opposite of their sum, and that's going to give me the x uh, that we need in order to, to satisfy this. And I'm calling x a and y b, and x is minus a minus b, like this. So a and b are two colors that we get to choose from this list. And then as soon as we choose those two colors, the value of the third is determined. Right. So uh, just as an example, So, for example, if I call the three colors in my crayon box over here, if I think of zero as being red and one as being green, and then maybe two as being blue or something like that, then because we get to choose A and B uh, from among zero, one, and two, we could choose them both to be the same. Like, let's suppose I chose A and B to both be one. Right? In other words, I would color the arc Y and the arc Z, I would color them both green. Um, if I did that, then those values would determine a value for X. Namely, X would be negative 1 minus 1. But that's negative 2. But we're working modulo 3, and negative 2 is the same as 1. So if I color two of these arcs green, I'm forced to color the third one green. Um, and that's not a very interesting tricoloration, right? Um, because any knot diagram, we can color all the arcs the same color and just wash our hands of it. It's not interesting. It's not a valid coloration. It's not an interesting one. But we get to choose these two colors. And because we get to choose both of two colors, we can choose those two colors to be different. And if I choose the two colors to be different, let's say I pick A to be 1 and B to be 2. Uh, two. So that what I'm doing is coloring the Z arc blue and coloring the Y arc green. Like this. Now we take those values and we substitute them into my X equation from up here. X equals negative 1 minus 2. That's negative 3, but negative 3 modulo 3 is the same as 0, meaning I have to color my third arc red. And when I do that, I get a valid tricoloration that actually does use all three of the colors. So the fact that I had more than one free variable in this process is the reason that we got to choose different colors for at least two of the arcs in my diagram. And as soon as I can choose different colors for two of the arcs in my diagram, the determined variable, the bound variable x, just follows the other ones and occupies that third color. So that's how we know that there is a valid tricoloration for this, because we have more than one free variable. More than one free variable. Means that a non-trivial three coloration exists. And what's great about this is that this is a recipe that we can use for any knot diagram at all. Um, so what I'd like to, for you to do next is to get a, just a little bit of practice, not necessarily going through the, the whole process, but take this six crossing diagram. And with your group, I would start by just coming up with six letters of the alphabet that you want to assign to the arcs on this diagram, uh, and then come up with the six by six system of linear equations that we can try to use to determine whether or not this six crossing knot is tricolorable, is three colorable. Um, so take about 
10 or 15 minutes and just try and crank out what is that system of equations. We'll come back together and we'll solve that equation using technology. Sorry, now I realize I didn't put this in my camera yet. Um, here is the six crossings knot in activity number four. Um, remember that when you build a system of linear equations for this, each equation is going to come from one of the crossings. And each variable, each column, if you like, is going to correspond to the color of one of the arcs. So label the arcs in this diagram, I don't know, U, V, W, X, Y, Z or something like that and come up with these six equations that are going to be whose satisfaction is equivalent to the tricolorability of this six crossing knot and then we'll come back together we'll use the technology and actually solve that system so nice job uh, you went through and for each one of the crossings in this diagram set up an equation uh, that is going to be satisfied if and only if the colorability criteria are met at that crossing so for example if I look at this crossing up here on my diagram, this is where the arcs A, B, and F all come together, the arcs I've labeled A, B, and F, and that gives rise to this first equation here, A plus B plus F must be equal to zero. And again, we're trying to use three colors here, and that's why we're interpreting this linear algebra here as all being linear algebra modulo three. So we run through that same process for each of the six crossings, and we get this big six by six matrix equation. Um, we can row reduce this matrix equation using mod three arithmetic, uh, which is a task much better suited for a computer than for a person, particularly for a six by six matrix. Um, if we use a sage cell uh, to do that, as I've supplied for you in this problem, this is team one's work here, um, we get a reduced row echelon form that looks like this. So let's unpack what this reduced row echelon form is telling us. So if you notice, there's one piece of this reduced row echelon form that looks kind of different from the rest. It's this bottom row. It's a row that has all zeros in it. Functionally, what that's doing for me is it's going to be giving me one free variable, but it's the only free variable that we're going to get. So all of the other rows are a one and then a bunch of zeros until we get to the end of the line where we just get a two. So we have this whole column of twos here. And then we have diagonal ones going down this way. Could I interrupt you for a second? Please. Um, go ahead. How did they do that? <laughs> so, <Please>? right. <laughs> um, this would take, uh, you know, the better part of one lecture of linear algebra to describe. Um, but the what we're doing here is we are performing elementary row operations on this matrix. Um, in other words, we would be doing some combination of either swapping rows, which is the same as just trading which equation is listed first versus second, which doesn't change the solution set of my system, or multiplying a whole row by a constant, which is the same as multiplying an equation on both sides by a constant, which again doesn't change the solutions, um, or adding a multiple of one row into another row, which again doesn't change the solution set. So those are the three elementary row operations. We would be doing them all using mod three arithmetic, which is not something we teach in a first semester linear algebra course. Um, but the row operations are still the same with the ultimate goal of trying to sort of get as many zeros into my system as possible so that we can determine the values of my unknown variables. Um, so yeah, this is sometimes called Gaussian elimination or Gauss-Jordan elimination or elementary row operations. Um, we get what's called the reduced row echelon form. It's kind of the simplest expression of the solution set of a linear system is the REF. Um, and so what it is telling us in this example, if we turn this back into equations, this is a step that for whatever reason, my linear algebra students always forget <laughs> what it's about. Um, but this first equation would be telling me a plus 2f is equal to zero. B plus 2f is equal to zero. C plus 2f is equal to zero. D plus 2f is equal to zero. E plus 2f is equal to zero. And then my last equation is just zero equals zero, which is just a truism, right? No, that's not telling me anything interesting. And so that equation, because it's true regardless of the values of A, B, C, D, and F, we can just sort of forget that it's there. Right? So these five equations are really telling me what I need to know. And of these five, A through E are all in what we call these pivot positions. The values of A, B, C, D, and E are all going to be determined by the value of my non-pivot variable, which is in this case f. So f is a free variable in this case. f is free. I can pick f to be, oops, can't use a anymore, call it t. I can pick f to be whatever number that I want to among 0, 1, and 2. Right? 
And as soon as I pick a value for f, I'm going to be able to determine all the values for a, b, c, d, and e from that value of f using these other equations. But if a plus 2f equals 0, what is plus 2 the same as mod 3? What's another way to say plus 2? Two hours after hours 0. After minus 1. Is the same as 1 hour before 0. And so if I solve this equation, a minus f equals 0, it's going to tell me that a is equal to f, right? Or if f is my free parameter t, I would just say that a is equal to t. So whatever color I choose for the arc f, this is telling me that the arc a has to have that same color. Right? If I make f red, then I have to make a red. And notice that the same happens for all of my other variables as well. Right? b plus 2f equals 0 tells me that b must be equal to negative 2f, which is the same as positive 1f, which is the same as t. Same thing with c, same thing with d, same thing with e. So my solutions of this 6 by 6 system all have this form. Whatever value I want to pick for my f arc, I can pick it. I can make it red, I can make it blue, I can make it green, it doesn't matter. That one is my choice. But as soon as I pick a color for the f arc, which is this one right here, as soon as I color that one in, this is telling me that I have to use that same color for all my other arcs. So the only way to color this diagram with three colors in a way that meets our needs, meets our coloration rules, is to color the whole diagram with the same color, which we can always do for any knot diagram. And so it's not interesting at all. So how I would sort of make our conclusion here is that the only valid coloration for this diagram is trivial. The only valid three coloration for this diagram is trivial. The one in which all colors, all arcs are the same color. Because that trivial coloration is always possible for any knot diagram, we always expect that when we do this process, we're going to come up with at least one free variable. Right? There's always going to be at least one free choice. I can always pick the color of one of my arcs. right? Um, because that color could then get me started on a trivial coloration of the whole thing. So the algebra can't tell that that's not an interesting solution, so it's always going to pop it up as a solution. So it's only when we get more than one free variable that we're going to have the possibility of then having a non-trivial coloration. So before we conclude this example and take a short break for today, um, I want to look at what would this look like if instead of three colors, we wanted to try to use four. Let's try and soup this up a little bit. If I had an extra crayon in my color box, could I have a valid four coloration for this diagram? So to do that, we actually have to go back and revisit our magical equation. Because mod three had this form because negative two was the same thing as positive one, right? Our original version of this was up here. One color, the, 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 the sum of the colors of the two uh, highway arcs minus twice the color of the bridge arc, right? So the bridge is, is distinct from the other two arcs in this formulation. So what we would need to do if we're doing this mod four is we would return to this form of the equation, add the two under arcs and subtract twice the over arc at each of my crossings. So I'll just run back through our diagram and do that really quickly. So at crossing number one, where A, B, and F come together, my over arc, my bridge arc here is the arc A. And so the A arc would get the negative two. And the two highway arcs, the B and the F, would keep the one. Right? So we're just going to go through each of these crossings and mark which one was the bridge. Uh, where A, B, and C come together, that's this crossing right here. And at that crossing, B is my over arc, so I'll put a negative two there. Uh, at the third crossing, B, E, and F all come together. B, E, and F. Uh, that's So B, E, and F all come together right here, and F is my over arc, so we'll make this one into the minus 2. Uh, at crossing number 4, that's A, D, and E, uh, and so that's the one over here. So this one was 3, this one over here is 4. And at crossing number 4, my over arc is E, so I'll put my negative 2 there. Crossing number five is where C, D, and E come together, and that is this one down here. 
and D is my over arc on that one, so I'll put my negative 2 there. And finally, crossing number 6 is where the C, D, and F come together, and C is my over arc. One of the nice things about this particular diagram uh, is because this is what's called an alternating diagram for a knot, if I'm driving a car around this diagram, I'm going to go under bridges and over overpasses alternatingly. So I'll go under a bridge, and then the next thing I'll do is I'll go over and overpass, and then under, and then over, and so forth. And what that does for me is it actually guarantees um, that I have only one negative two in each row and one negative two in each column. That's sort of the same numbers of bridges as I have highways. Um, and so I have now this matrix, which I would then row reduce not modulo three, but modulo four. Uh, so let's do that again using the Sage cell uh, that we have built for the purpose here. So in my Sage cell, what I need to do is change my integer mod ring from three to four so that we're working with uh, the new modulus. Then I just need to type in all 36 entries of this matrix. So if we, if we do this, if we try to do this row reduction mod four, it ends up failing because the integers modulo four don't have a division operation. Let's see if we can go up to five colors instead, because the integers modulo five do have a division operation. If I do that row operation, what we find out is that the same thing happens as before, right? We have only one free variable, so you get to pick the color of one of my arcs, and all the others satisfy, for example, a plus 4f is equal to zero. But modulo 5, 4f is the same as minus 1f. So once again, whatever color that I assign to the f arc, that same color is going to get applied to all of the arcs in my diagram. So we conclude that there's no five coloration, and therefore there's no four coloration. There's no way to use just four colors because that would also show up as a five coloration. Um, same thing with three coloration, we can't do it. If we go one step higher, it probably is still gonna fail at this, let's find out. Yeah, it still doesn't like it, so it's not gonna find a six coloration for this. But I claim that there actually does exist a six coloration for this diagram. Um, does somebody see why there must be a six coloration for this without doing any calculation? Since there's only six arcs, if I just color them all different, I know for sure that I'm using all my colors, and also that that condition that all three colors at each arc are different must be satisfied. Um, if we can't detect it using mod six arithmetic, maybe we can ask it to try to detect it using uh, mod seven. No, it still doesn't do it. That's interesting. When I do this row operations uh, modulo seven, we end up still getting the trivial solution. So it's kind of interesting. But again, we must know that there is a six coloration for this, because all we have to do is color all six arcs to be different.